Michael Clark for the road trip, and if you've been listening to the road trip on 680 CGOB and have maybe heard a little bit of my ramblings on this program about a very special 1966 Imperial Crown, well, here it is, codenamed Tyrant. And a lot of people have been talking to me about custom cars and trying to figure out where exactly it's going. What exactly should you be doing to this classic old iron? And more importantly, should you simply be concerned with the Camaros and the Mustangs and the two-door hardtops? Or should you consider the practicality of a very large four-door like this beautiful Imperial Crown? Well, that's exactly what this build is about. It's about taking something like this that maybe people only thought you could do a full-on restoration to and taking it to the next level. Now we're going to be talking to Tyler Scarf from HPI Customs. And if there's a place that you need to start learning when it comes to builds of this caliber, it's a little town called Beausager, Manitoba. That's where HPI Customs is based. Now the big news on this car is that it appeared at this year's 2013 SEMA in the Paxton Supercharger booth. Now, that may sound interesting to some, but you have to remember how big of a deal it is to not only be in the biggest show, but to be on the floor. And that's where this car was. The buzz has been out of control. It's been appearing in places like Hot Rod Magazine, and you're going to keep seeing different stories on the web as well as print as the months go by. We're even trying to see if we might be able to get it into a Mopar stand down the road. But we're going to tell you everything there is to, that you need to know about this car. It's a very high dollar build, but when you see where those dollars were spent, you're going to know that this is something that not only looks the part, but can drive it too. Now, if you've got thoughts, feelings, or questions about the Tyrant, or if you want to know more about HPI Customs, by all means, send an email to steelbeltedmind at gmail.com. Buckle up, it's time for the road trip. Well, we're here now with Tyler Scar from HPI Customs, and he's had quite a trip when it comes to the ins and outs of SEMA 2013. He's made a lot of new big friends, I'm sure, and he's got a lot of people to stop at the Paxton Supercharger booth to take a look at the Tyrant. Tyler, I want to thank you for joining us once again on the road trip. Thanks for having us again. Now, Tyler, let's talk about the vision that came to be for a car like this. Now, people need to know that this isn't your first time to SEMA, but it's definitely a step up as to where you got to be inside the show. Right, we got some pretty high profile visibility being in the Vortec Paxton booth, uh, right in the main central hall. Uh, it's been an unreal experience. And it was kind of interesting that we even got to go in uh, just based on the fact that we told them we're building a four-door. And once they started seeing the build pictures, the ideas, the, the concept renderings, they said, we got to have this. Do you think people think about a four-door in the sense of a car that they want to not only restore, but take to the next level, which has really been affecting the uh, custom movement, pro touring, resto mods, really bringing these cars into the 21st century? I don't think they get enough credit for, for what they are, especially in a car like this that was designed as a four-door. You know, th those type of vehicles tend to look better with more doors than, than a coupe anyways, um, but it's a viable option for people that can't go out and start at an entry-level price of 20 grand for a, a car that needs a total resto just because it's a two-door hardtop. Now, I've done a little bit of digging on the history of the Imperial Crowns, and the one thing that's really unique to the Imperials, obviously part of the Chrysler Group, is that they hung on to the full frame long after all the other divisions of Chrysler had gone to unitized construction. Right, and this thing's a tank, too. I think factory curb weight was over 5,500 pounds and they did not skimp on any of the metal. Uh, we shaved off a lot of weight on this car, specifically on the frame, and uh, it's turned into a really neat platform because we've taken a land yacht, stripped it down a little, given it all the amenities, and now it's a full-on pro touring beast. Well, let's get into the chassis. Now, what people need to remember is that while it is a 66 Imperial Crown in skin, there is nothing here that remains of the original frame. 
Right, the original frame was used for CAD drawing mock-up of the new chassis just specifically to plot the body mounts. And then from there we added our, uh, the Speedtech universal front clip that we've been using in a lot of things. It made its debut this year at, at SEMA, so this was kind of a trial platform for it. And that's based off C6 Corvette geometry with their aluminum forged spindle. And then in the back we've got a torque arm rear suspension on a full floater Ford 9 inch. And to connect the two is an HPI Customs specifically built for this car, one of chassis. Now the thing that people need to remember is that once you take a thousand pounds out of a vehicle like this and give it the proper dynamics that things like Speedtech can afford you, you're almost taking this vehicle into a realm that could be considered M5? Right, and it's funny you say that because when we sat down with the customer and came up with the idea for the car and started tossing things around way before it was even going to be an Imperial, we knew that it couldn't be a two-seater, two it couldn't be a two-door. Uh, you know, he's got tall children, wants to involve them in, in the hobby, and you can't with a, a first-gen Camaro or a Firebird or a Vet or, you know, any of those type of cars. It's hard to fit the whole family in. So we said, okay, what can we do that's classic that encompasses all the modern amenities, looks cool, and fits the whole family. And we started looking into the four-door route. We couldn't do a Lincoln. Uh, it's been done. We didn't want to put bags and 22s on it. And, you know, the Impala thing, it just not, it's too mainstream. So we said, what's out there? And then, bing, light came on. The Green Hornet movie came out. We started seeing that car in the media spotlight. And we said, yeah, we could, we could take that a step further. We won't have 30 cals on the hood. but let's see what we can do with this. We found this car in Alberta. It got driven back to Manitoba on bias plies, pulled apart, and this is what we ended up with. Well, what we're also going to do today is we're going to point out some of the signature cues that HPI Customs has added to this car. To the untrained eye, there's an awful lot of metal work here that has been added that almost looks like it grew there. Right, we, we kind of thought uh, when we were designing this car, what if SRT was around? in the 60s. What would they have done to a car like this to just change it from the regular lot models and add a little bit, bit of that European flair? And so we didn't go crazy. Uh, we, had, we had some help from Ben Hermans of Hermans Designs and we threw all our ideas together, came up with an artist rendering and started building the car. And like you said, it is you know, very much European M5 in, inspired even down to color scheme as to uh, what we wanted to do with the car. Well, I think what we should do is we should pull these gorgeous pins out and take a look at that Paxton supercharger-fed Viper V10. Right, let's, let's have a look. Now, Tyler, I'm looking under the hood here of this particular Imperial Crown. I mean, the great thing to tell our viewers is that there's a heck of a lot of room here for the Viper V10, but I have to ask the question, where exactly do you find something like this? We work closely with a, a salvage yard out of the States that goes out and wrecks cars specifically to our request. And they were able to find this low mile Viper motor in the year range we wanted um, without breaking the bank as much as it would have if we went to Mopar and bought it as a crate engine. Now, with this type of setup too, thinking about the extra boost that the Paxton supercharger is going to give you, did you have to concern yourself with a lot of internal issues? Is it basically a rock solid engine to begin with? It's a pretty solid motor. It can handle the boost levels that are in here as is. Internally we did nothing to the motor. It's running a custom tune, uh, it's running a custom harness, and it's running the Paxton kit the same way you would if you had bought a Viper and wanted to put their kit on. That was kind of the part, the point of using this, this product and putting it in their booth was that okay this may not be something that's in their catalog but it is a complete kit as you would use it on a Viper if this was sitting in a Viper car. Well let's talk about that Paxton supercharger that's been put on here and I guess the first question that a lot of our high performance viewers want to know is just how much boost have you dialed up through the V10? At only eight pounds of boost without anything but the air to water intercooler this thing is cranking out about 750 horse. That's at the crank. Um, we've added snow performance water methanol injection as an additional chemical intercooler, and that should put us in the 800 realm. 
There definitely seems to be plenty of room when it comes to putting in the headers here. Now, did you have to go with uh, custom units for this, or is this an off-the-shelf item for the Viper? Those are off-the-shelf for an SRT10 Dodge Ram. The Viper headers point straight out the side. We didn't want to put side pipes on the car. So we used the Dodge Ram headers. We've sucked the motor down as low as we can. It's a custom oil pan that we built, and it is mated to a TCI 6X automatic transmission, but a six-speed with paddle shifters and tap shift in the car. Now let's talk about things like paddle shifters and really bringing the car to that M5 level that you talked about. I've always been wondering how easy it is to integrate these types of systems into vehicles such as this. Has the aftermarket really come to the table when it comes to the proper harnesses? There is a ton of stuff available on the aftermarket now and some really neat features that you see in new cars. Pretty much anything right down to the radio frequency ID tag that gets you into this car that arms the push button ignition system from a Lexus. Uh, and anything's fair game now. Now you have to have the forethought to plan it out and the proper wiring capabilities to install electronic stuff like that, but it is readily available and all you have to do is fill a gap between the applications you see in the catalog and what you're putting it on. Now let's talk about the induction system here, and I can see you've been up to your old CNC work here with this, this uh, beautiful arrangement, and I, I have to tell you, <laughs> that is definitely one of the largest uh, air cleaner elements I've seen in a long time. The air cleaner elements, exactly what they use in the Viper kit. We've tossed out the Viper air box. It's a piece of plastic, doesn't look very good. Works fine in a Viper, don't get me wrong. Uh, this is all hand-formed sheet metal. It's a hand-formed air box that feeds the blower. Um, and we've got the CNC machined retainer ring to hold it in here. And, uh, and from there, it feeds through an air-to-water intercooler that has a circulating pump and, an, and a heat exchanger underneath. This actually has dual rads for the motor under this closeout panel that you see. And it may look like there's a lot of room on either side of the motor, but every inch of real estate is taken up from the firewall, which we've set back to the nose cone of the car. Now the one thing that I noticed here when you come up onto the car is that you see the air inlets here. So you're, you're getting a great cold air charge that's coming into this induction system. Right, we've kept the hot air fed through the grill in across the rads underneath the air intake system and then that's pulled out through the extractors on the hood. So we've kind of got a cold air intake set up here that you would see on a new car right, right on the front of this car. Now, you actually had a chance to take this out for a spin in the Las Vegas desert, and so far, so good. No uh, overheating problems to speak of. No, it was right above 30 degrees, and we were sitting at 185 the whole time. Well, that's fantastic. Now, I noticed here, too, that you've definitely stepped up when it comes to the braking system. You've got a beautiful CNC backing plate for uh, the braking system, which, as we expect, is going to have a lot of pistons in the calipers. Right, there's six piston front, four piston rears. It's all Willwood components. It's on a bias adjustable pedal. So instead of a, an actual knob that controls fluid flow, you're adjusting the fulcrum point between the two master cylinders. There's one master cylinder feeding the front and a smaller master cylinder feeding the rear. So it's a balanced system, just like you'd see in a race car. Uh, and it's, it's really responsive. Being the proper ratio for a manual system, it's not assisted, but you can put your head through the windshield. Well, let me guess, uh, cross-drilled and vented for your pleasure. Right, and much larger than 14 inch in the front and just over 14 inch in the rear. Now, the other thing that needs to be remembered with something like this is that you, you want to try to find as many efficiencies for things that a lot of people don't think about when they're building a car. And one of the most exciting ones that I've seen on the vehicle is the lighting system. Right, the switch is actually from a new VW and Audi. Uh, and it's, it's got daytime running lights, they're actually LEDs, and you know, we've got the HID low beams and a, a halogen high beam, and we've got sequential LED tail lights and a full LED white reverse light. And definitely will cut through the night, and any thoughts of it being boring, this is one of, one of the most sharpest examples of how to use the new school lighting. Now, the other thing that I noticed here is how you've taken some incredible paint schemes and, and fused them into something that looks like it grew there, but I think people need to know that this particular color is not born of the Mopar group. No, this, this color is from a 99 Lexus, of all things, and it's just, it's right out of the catalog paint code. There's nothing crazy about it. 
the gray is a custom mix, and it was beautifully laid down by Auto Resurrection in Winnipeg. Do you think people really understand how crazy we are in this part of the world for cars? I don't think so. It may have something to do with the long winters, like you said. But, uh, you know, we've got a lot of neat ideas and a lot of things stored up that, that we can bring out and blow some people's minds with. And, and, you know, that is outside of the norm, outside of the mainstream. You know, we do the Chevelles, we do the Mustangs, we do Camaros, and we've done some cool stuff to those. But it's just neat to be able to stretch your legs a little and try and, try and do something different. Well, what we're going to do now is take a look at some of the fine detail work that's been done on the Tyrant. Now, Tyler, as a skilled fabricator, you have seen a lot of different types of styling cues that have been put onto cars, especially at a place like SEMA. Now, how do you take those types of things where you've got to cut into the metal and still bring it back to look as though it grew there? Uh, it's called restraint. You know, a little goes a long way, right? You, you don't have to overdo it, and we start to overdo it. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It becomes too far down the custom road and not not into George Barris territory but it becomes blatantly obvious that the car has been changed it's subtleties how do you put something there that looks like it should be there and you just it, it's taken a lot of time to do a very small component and that's that's the key I found well the one thing that really spoke to me when I first saw the car up close is what you've done to the hood and I got to start on those incredible hood pins I, again a, a, a custom piece looks as though it grew there right that's thanks to the CNC machine and a little bit of time in front of the computer those were machined to match the styling cues of the factory body lines and some of the original emblem pieces that are no longer on the car so it was something that's not from a catalog that became a part that looks like it could have been Let's talk about the heat extractors that you put onto the hood. Uh, again, it looks as though it could have been something that was born of the era, but at the same time taking it to a new custom level. I think that's probably the one part of the car that we kind of didn't show a little bit of restraint on. They're pretty large, um, but it was part of the artist's rendering, and it really does set the car off and give it that edge that, that it needed. If we had a flat hood on there, probably you wouldn't have given it the time of day. What I like is the paint scheme that Auto Resurrection put together here. So not only do you have the Lexus as the main color, that, that beautiful, beautiful burgundy, but you've also gone with a little bit of the flat finish and also incorporating clear into that. So it really pops when you take a look at it. Right, it looks as if there's three colors on the car. There's really only two. Uh, in the addition of the clear, it's changed it up a little. There is heavy, heavy metallic in the flat color. You see it outside in here, it looks very satin, but you can see it in the clear. And we, we didn't want to satin out the whole car and get rid of all the chrome. So we've tried to do a decent blend of polished components, the polished sections of the wheels, and some matte stuff to give it that jet fighter evil look. Well, and let's talk about one of the most obvious changes on the deck lid, and that is this beautiful, very, very subtle spoiler lip that you put onto here. Right, it's hand-fabricated sheet metal, um, and again, done as a bolt-on piece instead of welded and, and shaved into the trunk lid. This is like it could have been an, an add-on part from the factory. It was done to the rendering again, something that we came up with in, in concept and then turned into reality. Now the other thing that we've seen on a lot of resto mods and pro touring vehicles is the move to LED lighting. And there's certainly going to be many aftermarket kits available for the more popular vehicles. I have to ask you about the challenges that you faced here with the Imperial Crown. We got a pretty good team of companies that we work with that's willing to do one of things for us. And so we've taken the factory lenses and polished them up, cleaned them up, restored them, if you were. And we've had LED cards built for the inside. And they're not just LED cards, they're full sequential LED cards. So they're, they're a wave on a turn signal. And when the brakes come on, they come from the center out. You know, they're really cool when you see them in action. 
And speaking of action, well, there's something about this vehicle in reverse that really needs to get talked about because I remember the reverse lighting on an Imperial Crown being in a much different place. Right, they used to be in the lower section of the bumper and what we've done is, you know, it was a big challenge, but we've raised a chrome ring off of the bumper uh, that surrounds the factory fuel door and we've embedded 60 LEDs behind that in white and that glows out into the chrome. That's our reverse light. It's kind of a neat touch. Well, that must also help for illuminating things behind. Now, the other thing that I really appreciate about the Imperial Crowns, you, you've kept the stock factory license plate location, but what you've also done to this rear bumper assembly is given, given it a lot more breathing room, I guess is the best way to put it. Tell us about how you were able to get the exhaust to exit to the sides. Right, we've uh, not only have we brought both front and rear bumpers in a couple inches each and, and kind of tried to lose some inches off the length of the car and we split the rear bumper into a lower section that is no longer chromed and it really shows off the line that the chrome section now gives and we've brought the exhaust tips through the sides of the bumpers and you, if, if you notice from the, the Gen 3 Viper that the, motor, the motor's from, these tips are kind of reminiscent of what you'd see on the side of a Viper. So we've kind of tried to just tie in a little bit of Viper to the car. Well, Tyler, it's one thing to have all of this performance and you know, we certainly appreciate it. But the one thing I do know about what you've done at HPI with this particular car with the dynamic capabilities that it will have is the last thing that you want to have in here are the old school bench seats especially up front right we've kind of we've brought that whole dynamic of pro touring inside and we've really embraced the four-door interior space that we have uh, and that was in in thanks to our fabrication and so fine interiors that did all the stitching and door panels and seat recovery that's in this car now, let's talk about the seat recovery that's going on here because it actually comes from the camp of SRT. Right, these are SRT Magnum seats, front and rear, and we've had them restitched in our own design, but full power, both fronts are power. The back flips down. You can, you know, put a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood in the trunk if you need to do that. And, uh, and the, the console is from a new Challenger because we needed the tap shifter to work with the paddle shifters as well. So, you know, we've, we could have built a console, but we decided to go with a Mopar piece for that as well. Now, the one thing I remember about vehicles of this era is that sometimes on the inner panels, they got just a little too shiny, but it looks as though SoFine has really come to the table with an incredible rendition of new school working well with the old school, and not to mention that there's also some really cool machining that's gone on here, and it almost looks as though it could be 1966, but not quite. Right, he, he based the panels, Kerry based the panels off of the factory pieces, uh, but what he's done, I mean, he's just knocked it out of the park and done hand-tooled leather, the same as you would find in, you know, a custom saddle or something from, a, from the Western genre, and he's tooled it like the machining that we've done on the dash and valve covers and then stained it to match our gray, and then we machined door pulls and lock rods that match the other interior components like the shifter and the gas pedal. And, and incorporated speaker grills and everything that you'd find in a new car fit and finish wise into these doors. Now the other thing that you had mentioned earlier is that we have a Lexus push button start and the rest of the switches are all new school. Now I would expect that we've got a little bit of a sound system going on as well. It's a Clarion head unit, full navigation with a full kicker audio system. Uh, like you said, the Lexus push button, radio frequency ID tag. Uh, we've got the new Audi VW headlight switch. We've even got a sport mode switch in here that when you turn it on, it turns on the performance shift patterns in the transmission, manual shifting mode, and the extra kick of the water methanol injection. Tyler, I've noticed the carryover pieces from the original Imperial Crown, but the one thing I'm having trouble with is the grill. I I don't think you just went through some paint on the factory piece, probably for the simple fact that most of those factory pieces are so bent and out of shape, it's not even worth trying to do. 
bent out of shape or heavy, the, the grill, and I'm not talking about the bumper that's below it, but the grill was a two-man job to carry in, in its original form. It was all heavy, heavy white pot metal, thick castings, and it just didn't suit the look we were going after. So, I mean, we probably would make a lot of Mopar guys cringe, but we cut it all out. We did use the original surround, and we did keep the glass-covered headlights, which is key. I mean, that sets this car right off. But we hand-formed the entire grill out of sheet metal and, and, and plate steel um, and came up with this design, built it, painted it, installed it, and I think it looks really, really good. Now, Tyler, let's talk a little bit about the reactions that you received this year in Las Vegas at the Paxton Supercharger booth. It's been very well received right from the day we were bringing the car in before the show even opened. Um, it was just a sea of all the other exhibitors coming over to see what the heck this thing was. Uh, we purposely kept it off of the online forums and tried to keep you know the buzz down to a minimum so that we could really drive the point home when we got there. Uh, you know, being one of the only four-door pro touring cars to kind of exist right now i mean there's others out there i'm sure but to this level this this we've taken a big step over the ledge in hoping that it was well received and we got some really good accolades we made some really neat online articles we did tv interviews with some bigger bigger shows and uh and we've got some articles that will be coming out that we did a really neat photo shoot for out in the desert and you know it's it's been just awesome to hear the compliments from other big shops too uh, that have been giving us compliments and kind of feeding off of our ideas for inspiration the same way that we feed off of theirs. Well in addition to the show that people are watching today I'm also going to be putting together an article on the car that will be in autofocus.ca and I, I just have to ask the question though there's, there's always going to be that contingent that thinks that you shouldn't mess with a car like that. And I'm just wondering if that's a voice that's really starting to get quieter as the years go by. Yeah, you, you don't hear a lot of that anymore. Um, and, and not because we shouldn't. I mean, I, I'm an advocate for keeping some cars stock too. But it's, the point is, let's enjoy these things. They're not getting any younger. They're not getting to be any better condition sitting out in the back 40, you know, that they'll get restored one day. And in a car like this where you don't have the option of, you know, ordering up all the bits and pieces you need, there's, there's only going to be, you're only going to be able to take it so far and you're never going to do a hundred point restoration uh, unless you start, you know, recasting trim and, and spending millions of dollars on the thing. So people are kind of realizing that and saying, okay, it's on the road. It's not, it didn't get eaten up in the 27 cars they used to make one movie. You know, we can all enjoy this regardless of what it looks like. Well, again, an exciting, stunning example of what can happen to a car that a lot of people may have ignored over the years. Now, what we're curious about is what the next steps are going to be at HPI. And tell us a little bit about what's on tap for projects. We got a couple more mainstream things on, on tap right now. We're doing a 69 Roadrunner with twin turbos, a 6.1 Hemi, a T56. You know, it's gonna be a cool car. Uh, we got a 71 Challenger convertible that we're doing something neat to. Um, you know, we've got a 70 Chevelle in the shop. We've got a little, a little Nova that we did EFI and everything too, but kept it looking original for the purists. And, uh, and we've got a couple other neat things that, that we'll, we'll talk about in the future. Well, we're looking forward to showcasing all of them on the road trip. Now, again, Tyler, if people want to find out more about HPI Customs, let's tell them where to go. www.hpicustoms.com, or you can phone us at 204-268-4746. And are they liking you on Facebook yet? Yeah, we're on Facebook, and, and we've got a pretty good following there. Well, that's fantastic. Now, folks, if you've got thoughts, feelings, or questions about anything automotive, whether it be new school or new school custom, then send an email to steelbeltedmind at gmail.com. Tyler Scarf, I want to thank you once again for showing off the car to us here on the road trip, and congratulations for all the good buzz you've received from SEMA. Thanks for having us on the show.